Hello, let me start by welcoming you to this webinar, Choosing a Quantum Control Strategy. My name is Frank Vinza. I hold responsibility for partnerships here at Q-Control and am your host for this webinar. Some general housekeeping topics, questions, surveys, and follow-up. Questions are welcome and encouraged. Please post your questions using the Zoom's Q&A utility. This Q&A utility helps us capture when questions are addressed so that we do not miss your input. We structured this webinar with a break between sections to address topic related questions. Our goal is to respond in a timely manner. However, we may reserve some questions for the end. Survey, please complete, please complete feedback survey at the close of the webinar. Those completing the form have a chance to win a $50 Amazon gift voucher. I'd like to now introduce the. Uh, I'd like to. I'd like to now introduce the panel. So, Michael Hush, Michael, Chief Scientific Officer here at Q Control, completed his PhD in quantum physics at the Australian National University, where he won the University Medal for Theoretical Physics. Currently. Michael actively engages with diverse quantum technology challenges brought forth internally and by our customers. Hi, Frank. Uh, great to be here. Thanks for the introduction and looking forward to talking more about how to make it easier to pick the right control for your needs. Thanks, Michael. Leonardo Andretta. Leonardo is a senior quantum control engineer here at Q-Control. With the background as a theoretical physicist, Leonardo holds a PhD in physics from the University of San Paulo. Currently, Leonardo's focus is on strategies to reduce errors and create more robust pulses in quantum devices. Hi, Frank. Thanks for the introduction. Happy to be here and looking forward to talking more about stochastic optimization. Thanks, Leonardo. Maggie Liuzzi. Maggie is a machine learning engineer here at Q-Control. Maggie holds a master's in software development from University of Technology at Sydney, where she researched the application of deep learning techniques in the field of robotics. Currently, Maggie is applying machine learning techniques and reinforcement learning to novel algorithms for quantum technologies. Welcome everyone, and I'm looking forward to speaking about reinforcement learning when we have quantum models with unknowns. Thanks, Maggie. So we present these webinars to share knowledge with the hope that this exchange enhances your quantum compute experience and helps you move forward with your projects. In the first presentation, Michael Hush will explain the decision process you should apply to choose between optimal control, robust control, and learning control. Then Leonardo will show how stochastic optimization is used in regimes with large uncertainty and noise, which are traditionally out of reach for other control design strategies. Finally, Maggie will explain how reinforcement learning can automate the optimization of a quantum system when it is subject to many unknown parameters. There are some exciting topics to cover in the next hour, so let me pa pass the floor to Michael to get the technical portion started. Michael, over to you. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, let's just start with the first presentation. At Q-Control, we specialize in quantum control techniques designed to make technology useful. Quantum control is the bridge between the classical and quantum worlds, defining how to interact with a quantum device in order to make it perform useful work. We've introduced quantum control in previous webinars and our technical writing. In this presentation, we will help you see through the technical jargon and teach you how to pick the right quantum control strategy for the challenges facing your quantum technology. Quantum technologies are likely to be as transformative to our world as the discovery of electricity was. Quantum computers can solve previously intractable problems in machine learning and optimization, while quantum sensors promise to provide insight into the world around us, like the movement of underground water, changes in the ice caps, and the location of mineral deposits. Both of these technologies are based on quantum devices that are pushing the limits of our understanding of physics and engineering. As in the development of any technology, we rely on mathematical models of these systems in order to develop new solutions. A major challenge we face is that our models of these systems often involve significant uncertainty in system parameters, or in some cases, completely unknown dynamics. 
Understanding how to select the right quantum control approach in these situations is often unclear. Fortunately, at QControl, we can provide clarity in these situations and get you to the correct solution faster. QControl's Boulder Opal makes designing and deploying controls on quantum devices fast and easy. In previous webinars, we have demonstrated how Boulder Opal can improve cross-resonance gates on IBM Q by a factor of 2.25, improve swap operations on IBM Q by 47%, and improve cold atom interferometer sensitivity by a factor of 10 in noisy environments. These demonstrations each use different control paradigms. In this presentation, we will present a framework showing you how to pick the best control strategy for your problem. To start, we will give an overview of the three of the major paradigms for the control of quantum systems optimal control, robust control, and learning control. Our aim is to give you real insights into how to select between these for your application. Optimal control focuses on the design of the best possible control for a quantum system given an exact description of its dynamics, typically through a Hamiltonian. By definition, it provides optimal solutions, but it is highly sensitive to the accuracy of the system model. Even small deviations can create output solutions that fail spectacularly. Robust control relates to the design of controls for quantum systems where there is uncertainty and or noise in the dynamics. This is typically encountered in real systems where tune-up or calibration may be imperfect or you may suffer from ambient noise. Robust control often trades off getting the best control in the ideal case for getting better overall performance under more realistic conditions. Finally, learning control allows you to find an optimized control when your model of your quantum system is incomplete and has unknown dynamics. Learning control involves giving an agent direct control of your device and allows it to run a series of experiments until it discovers a solution optimized in the hardware. Learning control can employ machine learning techniques to also develop a useful model of the device as this process occurs. Boulder Opal enables each of these three paradigms. We provide a flexible graph approach to constructing Hamiltonians, allowing rapid identification of optimal solutions that includes physical constraints like bandwidth limits. Boulder Opal also provides robust control optimization tools that cover the gamut of noise sizes and dynamics, including both non-Markovian noise sources and open system dynamics. And finally, Boulder Opal provides a wide range of highly tuned learning control algorithms that will cover any system, no matter what the noise level is or the number of parameters. So how do you choose? When picking which strategy to choose, there are two key questions you need to answer. One, do you have a complete model of your system, meaning there are no unknown dynamics or Hamiltonian terms? If the answer is no, then learning control is your best option because the agent will discover the relevant dynamics through experimentation on your hardware. If the answer is yes, then proceed to question two. Does your complete model of system dynamics include parameter uncertainty or noise? If the answer is yes, then use robust control. If the answer is no, then you use optimal control. Digging a bit deeper will capture the detail that supports the choice of an exact algorithmic implementation in Boulder Opal, but selecting an ideal strategy is really this simple. To help you with the selection process, we provide a detailed decision tree in our discussion topic, choosing a control design optimization strategy in Boulder Opal. Just work through the simple questions and we will help you hone in on the best solution for your specific technical challenge, subject to the real constraints you face in your experiment. This is a great example of the recent additions we've made to Boulder Opal documentation. We create targeted how-to user guides and introduce topics that give you an overview of the techniques available and help you choose which is the best for your needs. As an example of applying this complete decision tree, let's consider the familiar problem of using microwave pole shaping to improve the fidelity of single qubit X gates on a superconducting qubit device. Here you can see a summary of the steps that have been applied from using the decision tree in choosing a control design strategy topic. First, we ask if there is a mathematical model of our system available. The answer to this is yes. A good mathematical model exists for the behavior of individual qubits in superconducting devices. Devices can typically be operated in a regime where only a few levels of the superconducting circuit are excited, which have frequencies and couplings to external fields that are physically well understood. The next question is whether your system is subject to any uncertainties or imperfections. The answer to this is clearly yes. 
the frequency of the superconducting qubits does tend to drift due to a variety of factors. And we know the same can be true for the microwave control fields themselves. System drifts are very common in superconducting systems and constitute a form of uncertainty in our model. Next, is the system of interest subject only to weak noise? The answer to this is yes. Individual qubits have error rates on the order of 0.1% or smaller. This makes the noise perturbative. Noise sources that contribute errors well above a few percent are formally what we call large and require a different treatment. With these answers in place, the simple decision tree indicates we should use robust control with a perturbative cost function. This decision tree process led us to a series of successful experiments on IBM Q quantum hardware. We applied robust control with perturbative cost functions to individual gate optimization on IBM Q and successfully showed up to a 10x improvement to the gate fidelity and resilience against system drifts. These robust gates only required recalibration once per week instead of daily in order to maintain peak performance, constituting a huge time saving and convenience in operating quantum hardware. For more details on this work, see the Designing Noise Robust Single Qubit Gates for IBM Qiskit application note, or go to our YouTube channel and view our previous webinar on suppressing errors on real quantum hardware. You can also read the full technical manuscript published in Physical Review Applied. In the rest of this webinar, you will get to explore two case studies that demonstrate new features that have been recently made available in Boulder Opal. The first case study will apply quantum control to improve the operation of cold atom interferometers in the presence of platform noise. Here you will learn how our new stochastic optimization feature can create controls that are robust to very large sources of uncertainty, as commonly encountered in real environments outside the lab. The second case study will explore the challenge of creating two qubit gates in superconducting quantum computers where the system model is incomplete. Here you will discover how to use reinforcement learning to efficiently discover the underlying unknown system dynamics and deliver gate designs which outperform the best human design gates. Both cases will show you step by step how following our simple control strategy selection decision tree helps you determine the best control approach for your particular challenges. Welcome back everybody. So um, if you want to ask any questions, just put them in the Q&A function. Um, in the interest of time, actually, we're not going to wait long for questions for this section. We'll get straight into the physics. So that was a nice little introduction about, about the best choice to choose. Um, but we'll give you some now some really concrete examples from Maggie and Leo coming up in a second. So for that, let's, let's move on to the next presentation. But then at the next break, there'll be plenty of questions for plenty of time for further questions if you have any. Okay. In this presentation, we will look at improving the performance of code atom sensors in realistic environments as a case study. We will show how stochastic optimization, a new feature now available in Boulder Opal, can create pulses that improve the sensitivity by a factor of 10 times, even in the presence of strong noise. Cold atom interferometers are capable of providing state-of-the-art gravitational and magnetic sensing. In our previous webinar, which you can find on our YouTube channel, we talked about how quantum sensors can be used for applications such as navigation, persistent Earth observation, and space exploration. However, the performance of cold atom interferometers in practice can be limited by noise so processes originating from both internal and external sources. The velocity distribution of atoms, for instance, is an internal effect which limits per performance while platform vibrations which cause instabilities in laser amplitudes or frequencies are common external noise sources. Together, these processes can degrade the performance of the interferometer by a factor of thousands when transferred from the laboratory to real fitted environments. This is exactly the challenge we hope to overcome with quantum control. In this presentation, I will show you the steps to create uh, robust light matter interactions that constitute the Brin splitter and mirror functions in an atom interferometer using Boulder Opal's stochastic optimization feature, an approach consistent with large noise terms that may be encountered in the field. These steps are detailed in the application note, boosting signal to noise by 10 times in code atom sensors using robust control, which is available from the QControl documentation website. But what exactly do we mean by improving atom interferometer performance in this case? Code atom interferometry works by applying a series of laser pulses to a cloud of atoms in order to manipulate atoms with different momentum states. 
This sequence defines a matter wave interferometer whose interference pattern can be read out to identify the influence of external signals like gravitational acceleration. In the problem that we will be considering, we will want to create interference between the state of the atoms in the cloud using a process analogous to max Zander interferometry. For code atoms, the beam splitters and mirrors familiar in the optical setup are replaced by pi over 2 and pi pulses, respectively. We read out the interferometer by measuring fringes as we scan the phase of the final pulse. Our objective will be to improve the sensitivity of the interferometer by increasing the contrast of the final interference pattern. All the various noise sources we identified previously degrade the quality of the pulses that constitute the interferometer and degrade the visibility of the final fringe. The better the pi over 2 and pi pulses we create, the higher the contrast at the fringes at the end, and the higher the sensitivity of the device to small changes in phase. The noise processes and uncertainties that deteriorate the quality of these interference patterns originate from both the laser and the cloud of atoms. Specifically, we will focus on the noise that originates from instability in the laser amplitude and the dephasing noise caused by momentum distribution of the atom cloud. Laser beam stability can be quite significant, induced by mechanical vibrations known as platform noise. Mechanical vibrations in the hardware can be translated into time domain fluctuations of the laser amplitude. Since the pi and pi over 2 pulses are generally defined for a fixed laser amplitude, those fluctuations translate into imperfect mirror and beam splitter pulses. Likewise, the momentum of the atoms depends on their temperature and can therefore vary considerably if the atomic gas is warm. The variability in momentum changes the effective coupling of the laser beam via the Doppler effect and again results in poor beam splitter and mirror pulses. Because both processes can be large in real field deployed environments, we will be particularly interested in seeking new quantum control solutions for the mirror and beam splitter pulses that perform well in the regime where the noise is strong. For the rest of this presentation, we will go through the steps necessary to obtain definitions for the mirror and beam splitter pulses that are robust to these sources of noise using Boulder Opal. First, we will look uh, into how to decide on the best optimization strategy based on the characteristics of the noise in our problem and why stochastic optimization is the recommended choice in this case. Next, we will show how to run stochastic optimizations in Boulder Opal and how to choose the best uh, set of parameters for your optimization. Finally, we show the results of the simulations for the performance of the pulses obtained with stochastic optimization and compare them with other strategies. To help you decide between optimization strategies, you can visit the topic Choosing a Control Design Optimization Strategy in Boulder Opal on the QControl documentation website. Here, we will use a simplified version of the decision flowchart to select the best optimization strategy for this problem. So how did we know that the stochastic optimization was the best strategy in this case? To understand how we arrive at this approach, we just have to know the answer to a few simple questions. Do we have a mathematical model for the system? Yes. Code atoms derive their sensitivity from our precise understanding of the relevant physics, so we have a well understood model of how the system works in this case. Is this model subject to uncertainties or imperfections? Yes. We know that the uncertainties associated with the laser beam amplitude and thermal vibration of the atoms, hence Doppler frequency shifts. Both of these, of these are noise sources as we have described. We know that these sources of noise will be stronger than mere perturbation, so it is a no to the question of whether the noise is weak. This leads us to conclude that stochastic optimization is the most appropriate tool for the problem. To demonstrate this, we'll also compare the results obtained with stochastic optimization with those obtained with alternative strategies that were not selected, based on the flowchart. Optimal control, which is relevant for systems devoid of noise, and robust control, using perturbative cost functions, which works for, well for systems with weak noise. You can find the details of how to write the code for our chosen strategy, stochastic optimization, by reading the online documentation for Boulder Opal. In particular, the user guide, How to Optimize Controls Robust to Strong Noises, contains a step-by-step -step information about how to use the stochastic optimization feature. We will now give you an overview of what you need to know about your system in order to apply the stochastic optimization feature to your problem. The first step is to have a theoretical model of your system that includes its noise sources. In our case, the problem we want to solve involves two pi over two pulses and one pi pulse applied to an atomic cloud. These are the pulses that we want to optimize. Adding to this, we assume the presence of two strong sources of random noise, whose probability distributions are typically given by Gaussians. In principle, any distribution, for instance, a measured distribution for an experiment, may also be used. With a system model and noise model, we can move on to implementing stochastic optimization of the mirror bin splitter pi and pi over two pulses. 
When we pass this model of the system with strong noise to the Boulder Opal stochastic optimization feature, it will employ the stochastic models that we use to describe the noise by sampling a batch or collection of random noise realizations. The randomly sampled batch introduces this stochasticity into the cost function evaluation. The optimizer's task is to find the minimum of, of the cost function iteratively. In each update step, the optimization algorithm uses the stochastic cost function to revisit the system model, sample a new batch of noise realizations, and evaluate the noise again. Boulder Opal optimizers give you a lot of freedom to tune the algorithm for your needs. With stochastic optimization, one key parameter you can control is the batch size. There is a common trade-off between quality of the optimized solutions and the time it takes to calculate them. In the plots on this slide, known as quasi-static error susceptibility scans, we want solutions which keep the infidelity as low as possible across a broad range of noise strengths. That's the definition of a noise-robust solution. In the graph on the left, with a batch size of 20, we obtain an optimized pulse in just one minute, but its low infidelity range is not as good as the solution presented on the right, which used a batch size of 250 and took around 20 minutes to run. For this reason, we recommend that you perform quick tests with batches of about 10 to 20, but ultimately design controls using batches larger than 100 for your stochastic optimizations. With these ideas in mind, we run the stochastic optimization for the two kinds of pulses that are necessary for interferometry using batches of 300 samples. Optimizing individually for each pulse type, we arrive at these two pulse shapes. In these optimizations, we've enforced a smoothness constraint on the solutions to ensure compliance with bandwidth limits in class RF and optical modulators. To compare the performance of the pulses, we show in these plots the value of the process infidelity after the full sequence of three pulses, with each point in the 2D array corresponding to a fixed value for the amplitude and the phasing noise. The center of the graph corresponds to zero noise. As we want to minimize the infidelity as much as possible, the objective is to maximize the size of the white region. The inner control line corresponds to 1% infidelity. It's easy to see that the stochastic optimized pulses on the left display the largest area with good values compared to the robust pulses created with the perturbative cost functions and the optimal pulses, which only have good results in small areas of the noise space. This is a clear demonstration that stochastic optimization provides robustness against large parameter fluctuations, even up to about 50% of the target pulse amplitude. We can better understand why the stochastic optimization feature is so effective by looking more closely at the trade-offs that the controls are making. By taking a vertical section of the 2D plot of infidelity versus noise strength and zooming in, we can see regions where each type of pulse shows advantage. The first zoom in shows that in the region where the noise is weak, the robust control pulses contained with the perturbative cost function actually have slightly better infidelity, but only within plus or minus 10% of the ideal pulse amplitude. In the second zoom in, very close to the origin, we see that the optimal control pulses actually have the best results of all three strategies when the noise is identically zero. As we can see, the key advantage of the stochastic optimization feature is not its higher performance at zero noise, but rather the fact that it achieves good fidelity over a very large range of noise values, about five times broader than the robust control solutions and 50 times broader than the optimal control. For this reason, when we simulate the performance of an interferometer in an environment with high noise, the fringes obtained with stochastic optimization show a much higher contrast than the ones obtained with the other approaches. As our objective from the beginning was to make the contrast of those fringes as high as possible, this result shows why stochastic optimization is the best approach to deal with this kind of problem by approximately 10 times. You can read more about how to use the stochastic optimization feature to generate optimized pulses for cold atom sensing in the Boulder Robo documentation website. The application note, boosting signal to noise by 10 times in code atom sensors using robust control, will guide you through code examples and results to show you how to obtain pulses like the ones that you have seen in this webinar. We're back. Um, we already have some questions that have come through. So once again, if you've got any questions, just hit that Q&A button. Um, thank you very much for that presentation, Leo, by the way. So the first one we have is, let me just move this window so I can see it clearer. Um, the talk mentioned errors distributed according to a Gaussian. Uh, can I use other types of error probability distributions instead? Yes, uh, Boulder Opal allows you to use create your own probability distributions from uh, a uniform, uh, uh, uniformly di distributed variable or a normally distributed variable, or you can give uh, uh, your own samples sampled from your own uh, particular 
uh, probability distribution or even provide uh, samples from experiment in, in which case you won't need to know from which uh, probability distribution you're sampling. Yeah, and that's particularly useful for sensing because if you've got some type of noise profile based on like a real thing, like a car or a plane or something, you can actually feed that directly into the optimizer, which is pretty cool. Um, next one is, can I use the same strategy to make pi pulses for a quantum computer instead of a quantum sensor? Uh, yes, so in principle, if you have like a model of a quantum computer that uh, where you know the, the physics, you can uh, use the same uh, an analogous strategy to create uh, gates in the same way that we use uh, this uh, stochastic optimization strategy to create pi and pi over two pulses. Uh, it, but there are like many different kinds of quantum computers. So if you have like a, a, a system, a, a quantum computing system that is not as uh, where the Hamilton is not as well known, please feel free to contact us. We have like other. Uh, uh, optimization strategies for other kinds of situations. Um, we have um, we have a slightly different question. Is there any scope for quantum game theory in quantum control strategies? It's sort of an interesting sideline. Do you have any thoughts on that, Leo? Uh, I don't know much about quantum game theory, uh, but uh, I think if you have like a, a problem that involves an optimization, these optimizers are like very uh, uh, generic in the way that they can work. So if yeah. the problem involves optimizations, we probably can uh, find an intersection there. Yeah, so my comment there is that, yeah, with quantum game theory, you're normally trying to find some type of Nash equilibrium with the exchange of quantum resources. I think I think you actually can do that in our optimizer, but we haven't tried before. So that, that might be a really interesting application anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, please, yeah please follow up with us if you want to have a go of that as well. Um, so in general, how long does it take to calculate a solution comparing like robust control with a perturbative cost function and stochastic optimization? So I think that question is like, how long does it take to create those solutions? Yeah, so uh, the solutions for the stochastic optimization took around 20 minutes for each. Uh, I think the, uh, the other solutions, uh, the, the robust ones were probably less than 10 minutes each. And, uh, optimal uh, yeah around like less than 10 minutes but uh, it, it uh, like it, it also depends on the problem you can like create a, a cost function for your robust optimization that is very complicated in which case uh, if you try to do a stochastic optimization with robust uh, uh, using the, the the robust strategy you might find that you will like take much longer than 20 minutes yeah yeah, I think I think the only other thing to mention there is that the length of the pulses is different so do you remember the different did the stochastic optimization and the robust pulses, they were longer than the optimal pulse, correct? In terms of the actual duration? Uh, in this uh, in this comparison, they all have the same duration to like make oh. sure that we are comparing exactly the same situation between all the, 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 uh, the, the optimizers. In the okay. application note, if you visit it, you see like a comparison with shorter pulses that are created with the, uh, from the, the uh, primitive pulses that are imported from open controls. Okay, okay sure. like that, that our longer pulses are better. Yeah, <laughs> uh, great. So uh, that I think that covers this section. So we'll move on to Maggie's presentation now on reinforcement learning. In this presentation, we will look at improving the performance of two qubit quantum gates on a superconducting quantum computer in a circumstance where we have an incomplete system model. We will show how reinforcement learning, a capability now available in Boulder Opal, can produce high performance control pulses that provide greater resilience against model uncertainty than optimal control. The performance of near term quantum computers is primarily limited by the error rates of two qubit gates. While best case performance can approach 0.1% in fidelity, we typically see two qubit gates with errors at least on the order of one to 2%. Today, we look at improving the performance of two qubit gates as a case study in choosing the right quantum control strategy. The first question you have to ask when selecting a control design strategy is how good is my model? 
the underlying physical mechanism that is frequently used to implement a CNOT gate on many superconducting computers is the cross resonance effect. There are various published models that describe this interaction at the Hamiltonian level, and using hardware parameters, you can compare model predictions for the system dynamics against experimental measurements. Here we plot the predictions of such a model against observed experimental data from IBM Q. The dotted lines represent the simulated evolution of the populations of the four basis states of the two qubit system, assuming the model provided by the IBM backend. The dots are data points from experimental measurements performed on the IBM device. After short evolution times, the model prediction and experimental measurements of the system dynamics diverge. How do we understand the origin of this discrepancy? To get a better understanding of what went wrong, let's have a closer look at the cross-resonance model. Here, we have written the cross-resonance Hamiltonian. The first three lines capture the constant contributions to the Hamiltonian. The qubit's frequencies and harmonicities and coupling have significant uncertainty associated with them, which is our first source of discrepancy. The coupling strength in particular can have uncertainty well over 10%. Moreover, in real devices, the strengths of all these terms will also fluctuate slowly with system temperature variations. The next terms are the drives that we apply to the qubits. These are normally calibrated on each experimental run and contribute a relatively small uncertainty. The most challenging parts of the cross-resonance gates are the additional unknown terms in the Hamiltonian. For instance, it's common to suffer from crosstalk where drives leak between the control lines connected to different qubits, and there may be additional resonances from other qubits or two level systems that contribute unknown dynamics. We now have a more complete picture of a model and its uncertainties and unknowns. Let's determine what control strategy to use. As introduced in Michael's presentation, we will apply the decision tree described in the choosing a control design strategy in Boulder Oval topic available in the documentation. Let's explore the process that led us to employ reinforcement learning in our experiments. To understand how we arrived at this approach, we can proceed by answering the key questions in the flowchart. Do we have a mathematical model for the system? Yes. Is this model subject to uncertainties or imperfections? Yes. Does our model contain all Hamiltonian terms? No. This simple set of questions leads us to conclude that reinforcement learning is the most appropriate tool for the problem. In this case, even robust control is unlikely to work because of the missing Hamiltonian terms in our model. To demonstrate the net benefits of using reinforcement learning, we will also compare the results obtained with reinforcement learning to equivalent experiments using optimal control. With the model introduced previously, we can illustrate first how optimal control fares in the presence of model uncertainties. In this case, we can use simulations to understand the direct effect of these uncertainties. The optimal control tool recommends a pretty complex pulse, which you can see on the left, which achieves high fidelity for the cross resonance interaction. In our simulations, we use a proxy metric for gate error based on repeated application of the control under noise. We see that as soon as we introduce uncertainty to the model parameters, performance degrades rapidly. In the plot on the right, the y-axis represents the gate error. Each calculated data point represents the average over an ensemble of models provided to the optimal control tool with parameter uncertainty as introduced previously, now scaled by the value of the x-axis. With only a small fraction of the actual experienced parameter uncertainty given by x equal to 1, performance of the optimal solution degrades substantially. This is a manifestation of the key weakness of optimal control, huge sensitivity to model uncertainty. So how can reinforcement learning help us in this scenario? Reinforcement learning doesn't require any model of the system. It implicitly builds a model representation by interacting with the system directly and iteratively, as illustrated in this diagram. Each training iteration, also called an episode, starts with the quantum system being reset to a base state, which is always the same for every episode. A pulse is applied to the system constituting an action. For each action, we perform 
measurements to gather information about the current state of the system and feed it back to the agent, which is the decision-making part of the algorithm. The agent then decides what the value of the next action should be. Each action adds a discrete time segment to a pulse, which is built up in a piecewise constant fashion. This iterative construction process is repeated until the full control pulse has been formed over all time segments defining the control. At this stage, the agent also calculates a reward, which could be a function of the fidelity achieved after the pulse is applied. The agent will attempt to construct candidate pulses over many episodes, which maximize the reward. In the collection of both intermediate information about the system dynamics and measurement of a reward on application of a complete candidate solution, reinforcement learning is distinguished from other closed loop optimization procedures. Let's now explore the key steps in implementing reinforcement learning using Boulder Opal. The first step is to set up the environment meaning that you define the control actions that you want to test in the system, the observable and how you can measure them, as well as the reward function. You also need to select and initialize the agent. And with these two steps defined, you're ready to execute the optimization. Let's take a closer look at the environment setup, which defines how your enforcement learning agent interacts with your quantum simulation or hardware device. We need to define three components the action, the measured state, and the reward. The action space consists of the set of all possible control values. Our current Boulder Oval reinforcement learning feature uses discretized action spaces. Here, we want to control the amplitude and the phase of each segment of the control pulse. We define the minimum and maximum values for each control. We discretize each range and list all possible combinations. The agent then decides from all these possible options, which value of the pulse segment should be tried next. Once an experiment is run with the action provided, we must return a measurement of the state. In this case, this is a set of observables generated from a simplified process of tomography. We must also provide a value for the reward. In this case, a weighted sum of the gate fidelity when applied in series. This is just one way of defining the state and the reward but you have broad flexibility in how you define them. So what is the agent exactly? Boulder Opal employs a deep reinforcement learning policy gradient based algorithm. It contains a neural network for decision making. It represents what we call the policy, a function which given a state outputs a probability distribution over actions, some of which are expected to achieve higher reward in this step or future steps. This distribution is then sampled to select the one value which the agent ultimately outputs, the value for the next pulse segment it recommends. Incorporating random sampling ensures that the agent explores more of the action space and doesn't converge to only exploit local minima. The information collected throughout each episode in the form of state action reward tuples is used to train the agent by performing an update to its policy neural network. When you initialize the agent, you pass in the number of possible action indices the agent can choose from at each step in the training. In order to build enhanced compatibility with experimental data access latencies, you can also instruct the agent to accept batches of data, multiple trial actions, and measured state observables in order to reduce experimental runtime. You can also define a custom learning rate with decay parameters if you wish to, as well as a random seed for reproducibility of the results. Reinforcement learning hyperparameters tend to require tuning for specific problems. So we have provided examples in the documentation of standard control problems a user might face with the hyperparameters already tuned. This means that the reinforcement learning feature could work well with other problems right out of the box, or at least provide a solid starting point for tuning. For expert users, we will be adding configurability of other parameters, such as the number of hidden layers in the policy neural network and the number of neurons per layer, among other hyperparameters. Finally, with all the components set up, you proceed to run the optimization within a training loop, iterating between reinforcement learning steps from the side of the agent and state observations and fidelity calculations from the side of the environment. 
ending each training iteration with an update to the agent's internal neural network using the state action reward tuples collected during the episode. It is possible to connect the agent to a numerical simulation, like we have done in this case study, but it can be much more powerful to connect the agent directly to experimental hardware, as we have in our published research. Returning to our case study problem, we set up a training loop as described and let it run. Over the course of the training, we see that the reinforcement learning agent starts finding better and better performing pulses as displayed in the main panel on the left. On the right side, we see histograms of the gate errors in a batch achieved at the beginning versus the end of the training. By the end of the training, reinforcement learning achieves both high average fidelity and also a distribution of candidate solutions concentrated near low cost, high reward values. Finally, let's return to our analysis of the impact of parameter uncertainty on optimal control performance. We saw that the performance deteriorated with any added uncertainty in the model parameters. The reinforcement learning agent is trained using the full parameter uncertainty considered in the real experiment, one on this graph. The gray vertical line represents the point after which reinforcement learning outperforms optimal control. In this case study, unless the model parameters are known with high accuracy, reinforcement learning outperforms optimal control. Going back to our problem definition, this X value would represent a four times 10 to the minus six distribution sigma in the frequency parameter and eight times 10 to the minus five sigma in the unharmonicity and the 10 to the minus two in the coupling. Optimal control only outperforms reinforcement learning when there is very little uncertainty in the parameters. It's important to highlight that this is close to a best case scenario for optimal control. In practice, there may be extra weak and known terms in the Hamiltonian, control distortions, and weak noise that would likely provide a bigger advantage to the reinforcement learning algorithm. If you're interested in employing reinforcement learning in your experiment, please have a look at our product documentation. You can learn about this feature through our step-by-step -step how to guide titled how to optimize controls starting from an incomplete system model, which provides additional detail of interest. And of course, please get in touch with us if you want to discuss the feature further, as well as how to apply it to the specific problems you're trying to solve. Thank you. Right, that ends the presentations. We have a few questions that have been come up. So first one to you, Maggie, is the quite a relevant one about how it actually works. So how do you get the fidelity values, uh, sorry, how do you get the fidelity values after each step? Um, will it destroy the current quantum state? Yes, um, due to the specifics of the quantum system, uh, what we do at each step is we actually reapply the pull the pulse up to that segment from the start. So we go back to the base state. And for instance, in step one, we apply segment one of the pulse. And in step two, we apply segment one and two and so forth. Yeah, exactly. And normally you have to actually use like a tomographic measurement to get the fidelity as well, which requires multiple restarts. So yeah, that's the best way to think about it. But that's all been done in these simulations. We're not just taking the fidelity directly from the, um, from the state. So uh, we also have another one. So can reinforcement learning be used for other problems? Yes, so the reinforcement learning framework and also our Boulder Opal feature are pretty generic um, and it can be used with different problems as long as you can think of them in a sequential manner um, and you allow some form of interaction between the agent and an environment. However, there's a lot of flexibility in how you define that environment that the agent interacts and learns through. Yeah, and I think that's something to be that's important. So like we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to set that reward up to give it the best chance of finding a solution. Um, so if you are trying it on a new problem, you should probably come talk to us as well. And we'd be more than happy to let you know, give some hints and tips about how we think it's best to design your reinforcement learning problem to give it the best chance to succeed. Um, so yeah, so how do you, there's, I've got another question here. How do you get them the uncertainties in the hardware parameters? Are these experiments run on real hardware or virtual machines? Um, so these experiments are running simulation. However, these tools can also be used with real hardware. Um, and the idea with the uncertainties is we have, because we know the model of the system, we know what the perfect value is. Oh. However, iteratively, we add um, an, an, a sigma to that. 
Uh, and that's the sigma of the distribution of the extra parameter that we add um, increases with when X increases in, in the plot. Yeah, yeah, and we've I just um, we've also run it on real experiments as well, um, but that's not what we're presenting today. Yes, so another another interesting question. So if the optimizer builds the pulse step by step, does it mean the rest of the pulse is left constantly zero, meaning the pulse length increases at each iteration step? And then so then the second part is can the optimizer produce fast gates, as in like twenty nanoseconds, taking into account finite AWG the finite AWG sampling rate? So I'll let Michael answer the second part of that, but yeah, the first one basically it does increase. Like that, we we start with a very short pulse, and then after each segment, we increase the duration. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So and that, that, so that's captured what happens, right? And then with regard to um, yeah, fast rate. So the the particularly good thing that the reinforcement learning feature has is that it can take discrete variables. It's actually built that way. So if you are really trying to push your AWG to its limit. Um, normally you end up having to deal with the fact that you have significant discretization of that pulse, uh, the pulses that you're doing at those speeds. Um, but the reinforcement learning feature can take that into account. So yeah, you certainly can use this to try and make faster and faster gates. And I think when we did run it on, um, we were able to get a slight reduction in the speed of the gates when we did it for single qubit gates um, on IBM Q. Um, have a look at the, manuscript for more details on that. I think um, Frank or uh, would someone mind putting that link to the, the manuscript in the chat? Um, but yeah, there's details about how we shorten some pulses. Uh, next we have, um, can, can reinforcement learning be used when I don't have single shot readout? So this, in this particular case, their goal was to generate a Fox state, uh, a Fox state in a system of a 3D cavity coupled to a transmon qubit. Um, it's a very specific question. Do you want to do you want to have a go with that? Maggie, um, I think that yeah, that basically. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, so you you don't need single shot readout specifically. So the the I think that was maybe another thing you could say. We didn't use the full state of the system. You um, and in fact the reinforcement learning feature is not prescriptive of like what the state is. Uh, but you do need like sufficient information about your state to kind of create your control. So when we were doing the, when we were doing these two qubit gates, we didn't have to measure like the third and fourth excited levels, levels and the coherence between them. Um, but we did have to get at least some of the coherence outside of just the populations. So it really does depend on your particular system, but you can certainly use an incomplete state representation and still get good performance with the reinforcement learning feature. Um, oh, he's going to so how long does it take to fully train an agent and um, what reinforcement learning algorithms are you using to like for the what you reinforcement learning algorithms are you using? Uh, so how long it takes to um, to train really varies problem to problem. Um, normally, if you train for longer with a higher with a larger batch size, uh, the convergence might take a bit longer, but you will be more likely to reach um, a, a real maximum and not fall on local minima. Uh, how, so it, it does require some, some playing around with that. Um, and so we, what something I mentioned during the presentation as well is that we have this batching mechanism where if the interactions with the simulation or the device are costly or they take long, then you can, you can use this batching mechanism. And in terms of the algorithm itself, um, it's a policy gradient based algorithm um, we use just one layer, um, one hidden layer in the network with um, 64, um, with, which has a small number of neurons. And yes, um, and it'll, um, the, the activation function, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, we put a lot of effort. This algorithm in particular seems to converge relatively quickly compared to other reinforcement learning algorithms. So that, that's an advantage. I guess and just around that, so in particular, um, so this one is how many, how much time of experiments is needed to attain convergence and reinforcement learning results? I guess more specifically, like how many batches did you run for the examples you were showing today? So today we were just running around 150 yeah. iterations of yeah. a batch of eight. Exactly. I think, I think in the real experience experiments we've run more up towards still in the hundreds regime. Mm -hmm. So in terms of actual time, like the, the time it takes in the device can be minutes actually with these superconducting devices because they're quite quick. We've actually been primarily limited because we often use um, a web access. So we 
do it over line online. So there's big delays basically between each, each experiment running because of queues and other uh, sort of issues related just to the latency of the web. Um, so some, when we've run them, they've taken an hour or so, but if you have direct access to the device, it really can be done in minutes. Um, yeah, it's not, it's, it's very easy to run it at the beginning of any kind of experiments you're gonna do for the day. Um, you, so yeah, again, again, it's about the time. <laughs> so we have a, um, so first part is how long on average do you think reinforcement learning training should be run to come to a solution that may be appropriate or does it depend on what's going on? I think, I think you've addressed that pretty well, but then the other part is interesting. So how, also how is memory and storage handled in the back end of Q control, even though it's a simulation? So in, at each step, um, the, the during the training, it interacts with the uh, with the Q control backend. Um, so we handle those things just in, in the backend. Uh, yeah. yeah, and so yeah, in terms of what so it, when you're using the cloud, um, you have your history of everything you ever sent to the web. So we do we do save that. So if you want to check back any of the commands that you sent, that's all saved um, and stored. But um, largely, it's it's the the actual online the actual online API is stateless, so um, it's basically just think of it as a, like a very advanced computer, um, which is calculating those um, those calculation steps. Uh, and then there, we also have a variety of interfaces available if you want to store your information. So you can actually use this additional tool called Mloop to store the information that you're getting from um, all of your experimental results as well. Um, there's a few options there for that as well. I guess something else to mention here is that everything that relates to the environment, um, you actually write the code for. So you actually there, you can store however you, you like the information. Um, and yeah, you can keep your information locally in that sense. If, if that's yeah. Okay. yeah, for sure. Um, we have another question. Is there a possibility to incorporate new error correction code algorithms with Q control? This is maybe a broader question. Do you, Leo, do you have any thoughts on that as well? Uh, my thoughts is that, uh, that we have like uh, optimizers and simulators that are uh, useful for uh, quantum uh, devices. So if you have like something that you want to, uh, uh, that in, in involves uh, what, what a, a, a simulation in a quantum computer would be like, it, we, we have tools for that. Uh, there's like a lot of, uh, different quantum error correction uh, strategies. Uh, some of them are like, we require more qubits than we have currently or that anybody will, will have currently. So uh, feel free like to, to talk to us to see like uh, what, what can be done in, in terms of uh, quantum error correction at, at the moment. Yeah, and I, I guess I just highlight a lot of the robust control and other control techniques we've talked about here today. They quite, they complement error correction quite well. So they can actually decorrelate errors and improve performance. Um, when combined with an error correction kind of uh, protocol. So yeah, there's a lot of opportunity to investigate how control and error correction can be used in Boulder Opal, as Leo mentioned, can really accelerate that. Um, another, another, another few, maybe I'll combine two questions. So one was, um, do, you, do you train them? Have you done live training of an agent on real hardware? And then the other question is, um, how easy or difficult is it to combine it with IBM Q devices? Uh, yeah, and so then it does the document in Boulder will have a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to run it on experiments on Unreal devices. Um, yeah, so we, we've run um, the agent with uh, the real quantum hardware, uh, IBM Q, and you can check our, our paper for that, the link that um, I believe Frank will share. And uh, yeah, we definitely, if you check out the documentation, we have a user guide that describes step-by-step -step how to set up the agent uh, and an example and how to set up an example environment as well. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's all quite straightforward. Um, can you share some more details about the policy network that worked well here? Um, I think I, I shared a little bit on the on the previous question. I think it's yeah. a quite equivalent to just how how the network uh, works internally. Yeah, excellent. And so um, I think we just got one more question then. So, how do you choose between using reinforcement learning and um, some other like learning control methods like conventional closed loop optimization strategies? Yeah, so I recommend going back to that flowchart that we showed. Um, it can be really, really helpful to navigate the landscape of all the different great optimizers that we offer at Q-Control. And in general, we've seen reinforcement learning work um, a little better for maybe situations with weaker noise than other of our closed loop optimizers. 
Um, however, yeah, I recommend going, going to that flow chart. And, and for sure, if you wanna discuss further how to apply any of these optimizers to your problems, definitely get in touch. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, that's the perfect answer, Maggie. You're right. That that flowchart really gives a good idea. And it, there's other thing, conditions like the number of parameters in your system, which will affect what your choice is. So we highly recommend you check that decision chart. Um, so then back to you, Frank, to tie this off. Yeah, back to me. So there was a good round of questions there. And if we didn't get to them, or if you think of other questions later, please email me. Email me. I put my email address in the chat and um, we'll, we'll get to them as we can. So thank you for attending and actively participating in this webinar. I hope you found some benefit for the time you spent. Uh, please complete the survey at the end of this webinar to, so you can go into the draw for a $50 Amazon voucher. I would like to mention again that we are a quantum technology resource for you. So uh, please leverage us. Um, we will send you a link, follow up email where you can book a 30 minute demo with our expert team and discuss your quantum control strategy specifically. So with that, and the, thank you panelists for making the time and the attendees for participating. So that now concludes our session. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you.